We are now moving on with the second talk of this morning. We have uh, uh, Nicolò Mitruzzi that re received the, the Bachelor and Master of Science, uh, both with honors and the PhD degrees from the University of Padova in Italy in 2006, 2009, and 2015. Uh, and the Master of Science degree in Telecommunication Engineering from the Technical University of Denmark in 2009 as part of the TIME double degree program. From 2013 to 2015, he was a postdoctoral research, research fellow at the MI, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Minchen, uh, Department of Electrical Engineering at the University of uh, Southern California. And from 2016 to 2020, he was an assistant professor at, at the School of Electrical and Computer Engineering at Purdue University. He is currently an assistant professor at the School of Electrical, Computer and Energy Engineering at the Arizona State University. He is a researcher founded by National Science Foundation and by DARPA focuses on the design and analysis of distributed wirelessly connected system using methods from stochastic, stochastic optimization and machine learning. Dr. Micruzzi authored 30 IEEE journal paper and more than 50 conference papers. He is a senior member of the IEEE. He was an associate editor for the IEEE transactions and wireless communication from 2016 to 2021. He was the co-chair for the Distributed Machine Learning and Fog Network Workshop at uh, IEEE Infocom 2021, the Wireless Communication Symposium at IEEE Glo Globcom 2020, and the IoT Machine to Machine Sensor Networks and Adopt Networking Track at the IEEE BTC 2020, and the Com Cognitive Computing and Networking Symposium at ICNC 2018. He received the NSF Career Award in 2021. Congratulations. So let's welcome our speaker. And the talk is about learning in wireless networks from federated to decentralized learning architectures. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for organizing the school and thank you, Michele, for inviting me to present today. <laughs> Yeah, so let's start. Can you all hear me, Isabel, all the room? Can you hear me? Good, perfect. Okay, so let's start. So it's not working anymore. Um, so it's not the uh, one time and then it works. Oh, okay. Now it's working. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, I'm going to start talking about a centralized machine learning architecture and then move to uh, uh, decentralized architecture, starting from federation, decentralized federated learning, and then a fully decentralized learning architecture. Okay. So before uh, I go to the main topic, I want to acknowledge the work of my collaborators and students. Uh, so the first part of the work is in collaboration with uh, my PhD student at Purdue University, uh, Frank Pochenlin and my uh, collaborator Chris Brinton and uh, our postdocs Ali Alipur. And the second part, the last part that we're going to talk about is with my former PhD student, uh, Chang Shen Li, who is now at Bloomberg LP in New York, and my collaborator, Jesuado Scutari at Purdue University. Okay? Uh, so I'm going to start talking about uh, centralized learning architecture. So in a centralized setting, uh, which is the, the classical setting, you have a bunch of devices distributed over the network uh, and a server that is solving some machine learning uh, problem. Okay, so in this case, the server needs to collect all the data from the edge devices. So these edge devices they collect, let's say, pictures, images, videos. They send all the data to the server, which might be in some remote location, and the server takes care of all the computation of all the training. Okay. Uh, so the machine learning is done centrally as a, as a server, and also the communication is happening centrally towards this uh, central server. Okay. So there is one challenge with this kind of architecture. So all these devices need to send raw images, let's say, 
to the server, which is going to use a lot of communication network resources. Okay, and also the, the server might be a mode, might be far away. You might also have an undesirable delay uh, in the performance. Okay, and so and so there is a lot of uh, network resources that are being used unnecessarily, uh, and it's also time consuming. And you might have billions of devices around the world that are collecting data and sending and need to send data to the server. So it's not a very efficient architecture. Okay. So and there is another problem that since you are sending raw data to a server, you might not want to share this data with the server. And so there are, there are some privacy concerns, especially if you're uh, uh, sending information, let's say your age or your health conditions and so on, information you don't want to share. Okay. So sending raw data is not efficient in terms of network resources, and there also has this type of privacy concern that we need to be careful about. And so the question is, how do we learn efficiently over a network in a way that is privacy preserving and also does not use as much communication and network resources? And that's going to be the topic of today. So uh, basically, what I'm going to talk about is a shift from a centralized learning architecture where all the communication and all the computation happens towards a central server, okay? So the server is going to be a very powerful server with a lot of computational power to a decentralized learning architecture where instead the S devices are all equipped with some kind of computational power. And so they're able to do some computation. They're able to store some information and do some local computation, okay? So I'm gonna to move towards this kind of architecture where uh, the user can talk to each other, okay? In the, uh, and they also do can are able to do this kind of computation. Okay. So I'm going to move from a decentralized to a centralized, from a centralized to a decentralized computing and communication architecture. Okay. And you're going to do that over uh, multiple steps. So before moving to that, I'm going to give you like a, an overview of a centralized machine learning architecture. Uh, so let's say that uh, we want to build a classifier that is able to tell apart dog from cats, okay? So we're gonna have a bunch of devices over the network that collects dog and cat images. They send these images to a server, which might be a remote. The server is a database of uh, uh, labeled images. So each image can be a dog or a cat, and then you're gonna label as plus one or negative one to indicate dog or cat. At this point, I want to uh, build a prediction framework. I want to, be, I want to train a machine learning model. So let's say for simplicity, I'm going to use a linear learning framework. I'll say. So I take the image X. So imagine I vectorize the image, uh, it becomes X. I, I compute this inner product with a set of weights, W. Okay. And then I take the sign that's going to be my particular. If it's positive, mm -hmm. it's a dog. If it's negative, it's a cat. Okay. So if you want to picture it, imagine taking this X vector and drawing it on high dimensional space. So let's say in two dimension here. So I'm going to draw this X points on, on this space. The blue ones corresponds to cat images. The red one corresponds to dog images. Okay. What I want to find, I want to find a, basically a separating hyperplane that is able to separate dog points from cat points. Okay. So the points that lie on this side, the one with positive sign corresponds to dogs. The one that have negative sign corresponds to cats. Okay. So this is a simple linear model, but of course you can think of having more complicated, let's say neural networks that can be much more complicated uh, shapes of this separating plane. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, maybe let's focus on the linear case just for simplicity. And so the, the, here the question is, we need to pick a set of ways that allows us to separate clearly dog images from cat images. Okay. So for instance, this set of ways that gives rise to this hyperplane clearly do not separate well these images, whereas this hyperplane here seems to separate well dog points from cat points. Okay. And so what is the best W? That's the question. What is the best set of ways that are that we can use to separate these images and to distinguish cats from dogs? So in order to do that, we're going to need to choose a loss function. Because we're going to do, you need to do some training, you do training based on a mathematical model. Okay. So we can choose a loss function, let's say logistic regression. We have this kind of logarithmic function. Well, if you look at this input here, this is the inner product that I 
I mentioned before, if y is equal, if these two quantities are of the same sign, then this means that we have accurately, we have correctly detected the image. Okay, you are, you are correctly labeling the image. And in fact, when this y times wx is positive, you assign this, uh, this function here, this penalty function, assigns a very low penalty. Okay, that goes on to zero. What happens instead when the label y is different in sign from this inner product wx, it means that you're incorrectly detecting the difference. So in this case, we want to assign a very high penalty, and that's what happens on this side when you have a wrong detection. Okay, so of course, this is a function of the ways that we are using for this classifier. Okay, so now we have a function here, which is a function of the of the of the input x and y. X is the image, y is the label, and w is a set of ways that you use to do this classification. Okay, so this is a penalty for a specific image and for a specific set of weights. So now the question is how do we train? While well, you look at the database, which has which might have thousands of images, you compute an average loss function across the database. Okay. So now here I'm averaging over all the images with all their labels in the entire data set for a specific W for a specific set of weights. And then how we do the training, I want to find a set of ways that minimize this loss function. They may make this as small as possible. Okay. And so that's the concept of uh, minimizing the empirical risk. Okay, so uh, of course, there are when you look at a machine learning problem, there are several questions. One question is how do you, uh, uh, what kind of uh, training data do you use? What kind of test data do you use? So these are all important questions. Another question is what kind of architecture do you use? Do you use a linear architecture? Do you use a deep neural network? How many layers? Now, these are all important questions that you need to address. Once you, and of course, what kind of loss function do you use to measure the quality of your prediction and, and to do the training? So these are all important questions. Another question is, once you have made the decision, how do, how do we do, how do we solve this optimization problem? How do we solve this uh, uh, minimization of the empirical risk, okay? And that's what I'm going to focus on today. I'm going to focus on machine learning through an optimization lens. I'm going to focus on how do you solve this problem efficiently over an network. Okay. So I'm assuming that I've already made those decisions in terms of training set, test set, or loss function, all of that in architecture. I'm just focusing now, once I made the decision, how do you do this problem? Okay. So Imagine this, the function can look like that, right? In deep neural networks, the function tends to be highly non convex, so you might have this kind of optimization landscape. And what you want to find, you want to find the minimum of this function. Okay? So, one very popular algorithm to find the minimum is the gradient descent algorithm. Okay? I mentioned many, most of you are familiar with it, uh, but I'm going to give you also some uh, theoretical uh, guidance on why. Uh, graded descent works. And so the way it works is that I initialize a set of weights, I initialize it at zero. And then over time, I have this iterative algorithm where at time k plus one, I take the previous set of weights and I compute the gradient based on the previous set of weights of, the, of this function and I move that in the direction of the anti gradient. Okay? So the gradient is the direction of steep, steepest increase of the function. I'm basically moving in the opposite direction of steepest decrease. Okay. I keep doing that until it converges. Typically, convergence is when the gradient vanishes to zero. Okay. So when, when I find the stationary point of the of the function. Well, uh, I'm gonna go a little bit quick here, but uh, I want to give you some uh, a, a proof of why uh, gradient descent works. So I'm gonna focus on convex functions, uh, in particular, strongly convex and smooth functions. So the way to picture it is that the function G is this one. That's what we want to optimize. A strongly convex and smooth function is a function that at any point can be upper bounded and lower bounded by a quadratic function, where the degree of curvature is determined by these two parameters, U and F, okay? As opposed to a no smooth function, which would be a function with uh, uh, sharp edges, or a uh, uh, non strongly convex but convex function, which would be a function with a kind of flat uh, surface in a way. Okay. 
So strongly convexed Lebesgue case is a is a nice analytical uh, assumption that actually the analysis it can be extended to also non convex case you know pretty somewhat deep. But it gives some intuition of why the rendered same works, and also it describes the behavior of the algorithm also in the non convex case when you are approaching the special bond theoretically. Okay. And so in this setting, uh, the optimal solution, what we are trying to compute, the minimizer, is a unique solution of gradient equal to zero. Okay. And so the way you analyze the performance of gradient descent, you want to look at the distance, the error between your uh, your, uh, your uh, the state at time t plus one and the optimal solution that you can try to compute. Okay, and you're, you're looking at that how that evolves over time. Okay, so now I look at the distance between time k plus one and the optimum square. I replace the greater descent of dates, that's what I'm doing here. Then I expand the, I expand this product, this square, I expand the square. So I'm going to have this term, which is the previous update. This term, which is a gradient, so remember the gradient as the optimal point is zero, so this is trivial, and then you have this inner product here. Okay, next step, I need to use some properties of strongly convex smooth function. So I'm not going to explain you where this comes from, but you can find it in a, in a famous textbook. Okay, so I'm going to use this lower bound to upper bound this quantity here. So now this term here will go together with this one, and this term here will go together with this one. So I end up with this condition now. At this point, if you look at this term here, as long as the condition, if the step size is, is small enough, if the step size is smaller than this term here, this constant, then all of this become negative, and so I can all support the price over boundary. Okay. So here I'm going to use another condition, which is a strong convexity condition, which gives rise to this one. Again, I'm not going to explain, but you know, it's coming from a strong convexity. So now I can basically upper bound this quantity with this one. And so all is going to be combined together with this term, and you end up with this. Okay. So what this is telling is that as long as the step size is small enough, uh, the the next update is going to be closer to the optimum than the previous one. Okay. And closer by this factor here, one minus mu eta squared. Okay, so at every step, as long as we have a sufficiently small step size, we are getting closer and closer to the optimum. And so that's why it works in PT. Okay. So the critical is choice of step size, we need to make it sufficiently small. Um, and of course, the assumption of the function that you can relax it with some kind of other convergence properties. But you know, this is a, a smooth and strongly on the scale. So if you choose a particular fixed step size, and you have this kind of geometric convergence. You know, some people call it linear convergence, uh, but basically, when k goes to infinity, this drops down to zero, which means that irrespective of the initialization, we are approaching the optimum asymptotically. Okay, and we do that geometrically fast. Okay, so now, now let's go to uh, gradient descent in terms of minimizing the empirical risk. So again, this function now that I'm trying to optimize is the average of this loss function across the entire data set. When you look at the gradient, the gradient one is the average of the gradient from which computed at each data point, right? So imagine if you have thousands of images, you're going to have to look at the gradient of the image at each image, do the average. This is a very computationally expensive step, okay? So in practice, you don't want to go through the entire data set at every single gradient descent update. You want to try to avoid that. So one trick is that instead of going through the entire data set, you do a mini batch uh, approach. You use a mini batch approach where at every time you pick a small subset of images, let's say one single image, you pick it randomly, okay? You compute the image, uh, you compute the grid only on that small subset of images. So it's called mini batch grid sense, but you know, it falls under the umbrella of stochastic grid sense. okay? So now, the advantage of this is that you can control the computational cost by controlling the minibus size. So if you make the minibus size small, you, you, you have a better uh, computational cost. Okay? But at the same time, you're not computing the exact gradient, so you have a mismatch between the, this like, stochastic gradient and the true gradient. Okay? And so you have to be careful on, in this case, how you choose a step size and how you choose a minibus and so on. Okay? 
So you have gradient errors, which tells you you need to be careful about. And so uh, here we're going to make some assumption. I'm going to assume that the mini batch is picked randomly and uniformly at random, which means that the stochastic gradient, which is this one, in expectation is equal to the true gradient. And I'm going to further assume that it's bounded in variance. So the error in the gradient is bounded in variance, which is the second assumption here. So under this assumption, I can write the stochastic gradient as a two gradient plus this uh, zero mean noise on the gradient, okay, with bounded variance. So now, how do you analyze the performance of, of the stochastic gradient and algorithm? It's similar to what we did before. You look at the update, the next step, you replace uh, this stochastic gradient and update here. You expand the sum, the, this, this square here, but try to basically separate the error part from the deterministic part. At this point, since you are dealing with random quantities, it makes sense to take an expectation, right? So I take an expectation. The last term here is, well, the expectation of the noise here is zero mean, so it disappears. This is uh, uh, the norm square of the noise, which is bounded in variance. So this is bounded by sigma uh, eta square, step size square sigma. And what about this? Well, this is the same as you see before. This is a uh, uh, one step update of the deterministic gradient and aggregate. And we found previously that is bounded by this quantity here. Okay. So this point, you end up with this. After you take the expectation, you end up with this kind of dynamical system, okay, which models the, uh, the, the, how the error evolves over time. Okay? The difference with respect to the deterministic gradient set is that you have this additional term, which is due to the error in the gradients. Yeah, so how to analyze it, you take the one step update and uh, you do a simple trick where it sum from time zero to k minus one, and you have, you have this product term here. So now if you look carefully, here you have k terms in the sum, I have k terms here. If you look carefully, you will notice that k minus one terms here and k minus one terms here, they cancel each other. It's called a telescopic sum, okay? So when I cancel these terms, I end up with this simple fact here where the distance of 10k is related to the initial distance due to the generalization. And then here you have the accumulation of the noise term, okay? And that's it. At this point, you can specialize this to fixed step size. If you specialize fixed step size, you will see that basically the error between the, uh, your variable and the optimum is bounded asymptotically by a factor which is proportional to the step size, which means that if you want to be more accurate, you need to, you're going to have to use a smaller step size, but it's going to take longer to converge. Okay? And uh, you can also use a decreasing step size, a step size that decreases one over k one over time. In this case, you can prove that you can basically uh, uh, approach the optimum arbitrarily closely, but it's going to take longer, right? The, the, the distance to optimum goes down is one over k. Okay? And this is, makes sense because the idea is that imagine, imagine a scenario where you are averaging gradients, i.e. these samples of the gradient, the variance of those gradients will go down as one over k. Okay? So in, in a way, this is the best you can expect here. Okay, due to the fact that you are averaging the radius over time. Okay, so you're going to go very quickly, but the way you prove this is that uh, you take your decreasing step size, I want to bound these quantities, so I'm going to use a trick where I bound this y minus x by an exponential, and the product here is moved here's a sum into the exponential. At this point, I have a sum of these discrete terms here. I approximate the sum of discrete terms with an with a integral. So I do an integration here, and then that with a closed form upper bound here. And then I keep doing the same. I do another step of, I have another sum here, and I replace the sum with an integral, and you end up with this kind of condition. Okay, so I'm going very quick, but that's the idea. I, I have to go through this proof because these are actually proofs that we actually use in more complicated settings. They're similar, of course, it's more complicated, but the concept is similar, okay? Yeah, so just to summarize, this is a performance of uh, greater descent on a centralized setting. This is a case of strongly complex smooth function on the exact greater descent algorithm. We have this geometric convergence rate. Uh, stochastic greater descent with constant step size instead, we converge to a uh, error mode with reduced proportion to the step size. And with decreased step size, it goes zero, goes down as one over. Okay? 
So now let's move to the second part. Now the question is uh, this central computation uh, is very expensive. You need to send the entire data set. Every device needs to send the data set to the server, and the server takes care of all the computation. Okay. So this is not efficient, right? So the question is, can we emulate the performance of the data set but over by, by decentralizing the computation? And the question is yes, if you look at uh, how the grid set update will look like. So now every device has its own local data set, right? So every device has its own dock and loss function, which is representative of the local data set. So this drone has G1, this car has data set, uh, which gives rise to the loss function G2, and this one is G3. Okay? These are all functions of the local data set. So Ideally, the server would like to aggregate all these loss functions and compute the average, which is a representative of the entire data set of the network. Okay. So the overall global loss function is basically the average of the local loss function, which means that in terms of gradient descent of data, the gradient is just the average of the gradient. Okay. So now you should see that it's relatively easy to distribute the computation, right? Each device can compute a local gradient. Send the gradient back to the server, and the server just does the energy operation. Okay? So, this is a classical federated learning uh, architecture. So, the way it works is that the server at time k sends the current model at time k back to the devices to the edge. So, now each device has a copy of the local variable of, of the variable wk of the global variable wk, and based on its own local data set, based on its own local loss function, it performs a gradient step based on the local loss function. So now each one has its own local variable, which is dependent on the data set. Okay. Now they send the new model back to the server. The only thing the server needs to do is do the average. Okay. So as you see, since each uh, local variable is obtained by doing this gradient step here, the average emulates exactly the performance of the centralized gradient descent algorithm. Okay. So in other words, we have decentralizing the computation. There is no need to do this centrally because we can uh, we can basically decentralize the gradient computations. All the server needs to do is to collect these gradients and do the edits. Okay. Yeah, and what about stochastic gradient descent? Well, it's very similar. So at time k, send the new uh, the, the, the current set of ways. Then the each device does a local SGD step, okay, based on a mini batch, okay, and with the property that I do this uniformly around, also that the expectation of this stochastic gradient is true is equal to the true local gradient. And then I send back the local variable to the server, and the server does the energy. So you see that this the energy of the stochastic gradient has a property that in expectation is equal to the true gradient. So we go back to the same properties of of the centralized as to the other. Okay? So again, yes. we are able to distribute to decentralize the computation, even with stochastic gradients, and we don't lose anything okay, in performance. We have exactly the same performance as centralized gradient descent and centralized as to be. Okay? So, uh, so now we come up with this architecture, which is standard federated learning architecture, where we have decentralized the, all the computing. Now the computation is done at the edge. But we are still dealing with a centralized communication architecture where every device independently needs to send its local model back to the server. So still, we have not solved the issue of network resources. It still requires a lot of back and forth of communication between servers and the edge in order to enable this machine learning okay, to, to happen. And all these things, you see, they use all the use network, they're all using network resources. So there has been a lot of work in the literature in trying to make this federated learning architecture more communication efficient. So for example, one approach is that instead of doing this upstream downstream communication every single time, I do some uh, a number of local computations. I do several rounds of stochastic HD uh, send locally, and only periodically I send the model back to the server. So in this case, I'm saving because in communication resources because I do only this. Uh, model of the and frequently, but you have a trade-off between accuracy of the training and use of network resources that you're going to be careful about, okay? Uh, other works instead look at uh, reducing the communication budget by using some kind of 
quanta gestão técnica tu quantas credenças ou tu compras credenças ou daí use less uh, less bits less sorry, of communication and so on. Uh, and this is a list of words that use this kind of approaches. Uh, what we do is something different, um, novel. Uh, so what we want to do is we want to move from a centralized centralized communication architecture where all the nodes communicate with the server. Instead, we want to take advantage of the wireless environment. Okay? Typically, we have a situation like that where multiple devices are close to each other and they are able to communicate with each other wirelessly using device to device connectivity. Okay? So you can take advantage of that by learning a local model by reducing the, the number of updates that you send to the server. Instead, you, you learn something locally. And since you're learning locally, you reduce the number of upstream communication with the server, and you are using much less communication resources. And you can do that also a lot quicker. So it's also the delay improves. Okay. So the idea that we have developed is that of not only decentralized computing, but also decentralized communication. Okay. Take advantage of this decentralized communication infrastructure that we have available thanks to the wireless channel. Okay. So the way it works is as follows. So imagine you have a number of clusters. Each cluster is represented by nodes that are in the vicinity of each other. So typically, you're going to have a base station, a number of devices, each one with their own local data set, which means each one with their own local loss function, and each one with some kind of some computing power. Okay. So in this case, I have two clusters. I have a server, which is again the mode. I have a global loss function. I have a cluster loss function, which is the average of the losses within the cluster. Okay. So I have various layers of loss functions that I'm trying to optimize, basically. Okay. So the way it works is the following: time k, the server sends the current model wk back to the cluster, and each cluster, of course, is usually through all. The base station, for instance, send it to all the devices within the cluster. So now each agent here has a local copy of the model at time k. Okay. So now this is called the model broadcast, broadcasting and broadcasting the model to the network. The next step is the cluster optimization phase. So this runs over a number of periods, okay? Capital T, which can be of the order of hundreds, for example. So within this cluster, we have now two steps. One is a local graded gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent step where each of the device performs a local training based on its own local data set. Okay, gradient descent trade here. Second, we have this consensus phase where we take advantage of the wireless connectivity, device to device communication here to basically share the model, the local model with all our neighbors. So here you see that we are not talking with the server, we are just Communicating locally, which is a lot more efficient, using a lot less communication resources. Okay, because it can be done wirelessly. So now we're doing so. I, for instance, this device number two is sending its model to all the other two devices. So every device contain is able to get a copy of the local models of all the other devices in the cluster, and it can compute the address. Okay. So by doing this average, what's happening is basically I'm learning a model that is optimized to the cluster data. Okay. So this has an advantage because if every node is acting independently of the other, the best you can learn is a local model, which is only optimized to the local data of that single device. Okay. Now, since I'm extending the optimization over that cluster, I take advantage of that fact that the cluster might contain several devices. If you Put together all the data sets of these devices, you might end up with a much richer data set that improves the learning. Okay, so that's the basic idea that we are developing here. So, by doing this approach, what we're doing is we're learning a cluster model, and we do that over subsequent stage where we keep doing local SSD and consensus iteratively over multiple times. And all clusters does the same at the end of this cluster optimization phase, we move to the global aggregation phase, where now, since each agent within the cluster has now the same model, the same cluster model, I don't need all of them to send the model to the, to the server. I just need to pick one of them, and this node is going to send its model to the server. Okay, So you see that now I have another 
point where I'm saving a lot of communication resources because instead of having three devices, all of them independently sending the model, I just need one of them to do it because because of this consensus phase, I made sure that all these models within the cluster are consistent with each other. Okay. At this point, the server does the same averaging process. And by doing this averaging, I'm learning now a global model over the network. You have a question? Um, when does the, sorry, I missed, when does the consensus phase happen? Is it after the 100 steps? Or yeah, no, no, this is done all the time. So I have, let's say, 20 periods. At every period, at every time within the period, I do one step of SSD and one step of consensus, let's say. One step of SSD, one step of, I keep doing that iteratively, okay? That's why I'm learning a cluster model. Your question? Yes. Uh, how can you decide the, uh, the number of clusters and the metrics you use the cluster? Well, the number of clusters is given by the topology, right? I don't decide that. It's, okay. it's a given, right? Uh, the loss function, of course, that's, that's as I said previously, I'm not concerned about that. I'm assuming that we already choose a loss function. We made already that decision, right? Uh, now, maybe your question is how do you decide all these parameters, like the number yeah, of the cluster parameters? Ah, yeah, yeah. Those are, we have developed a no line algorithm where we basically look at the trade off between convergence rate and the use of network resources, and we try to balance the trade off with an optimization. I'm not going to talk about it. You can look at the paper, but uh, we do that online based on these metrics, okay, we're, that we're trying to balance. Okay. For now, I assume that it's just six, six given. But you know, we have this online algorithm where we do that in real time. Uh, yeah, so despite I do the averaging as a server and I keep doing that, I keep going. I send a new model, broadcast, I do the cluster optimization and they do the global aggregation. I keep going until we converge. Okay. So that's the overall algorithm, basically. Uh, so the advantage of this, as you said, is that we are limiting the number of upstream and downstream communication with the server. So we use less communication resources. Uh, and consensus, the consensus phase is a lot more efficient because you know we can do, do it wirelessly. Um, and the nodes are able to cooperate to learn a cluster model. And so they can take uh, advantage of a much richer data set, which is a cluster data set across the cluster. Okay. Of course, the, the cost is that since now we are learning a cluster model, like the, the, the cluster model is not the same as a global model that we are trying to learn. So there's Again, a trade off between accuracy and, uh, and saving of communication and network resources. Okay, that you need to take care of. Yeah. Yes? Excuse me. Uh, you said that you're given a topology describing how these wireless devices are connected yes. to the base station. Yeah. And do you assume this topology to be fixed? Is it a reasonable function? Oh, no, we have key exactly variable. We, we're able to cope with the time varying topologies. Uh, we are assuming that within each uh, class optimization phase, it's, it remains fixed, right? But across these phases, it can change. That's okay? so where we have some degrees of uh, temporal variation in the network where devices can move from one cluster to another cluster, for instance. We have that, okay? We are able to accommodate that. Yes. So, uh, in the definition of the cluster, you are not considering the distribution of the data among the different sources. Uh, well, the, this is the data. Is implicit in the loss function, right? So the loss function is, is telling me the data influences the loss function in a way. But I'm not really making specific assumption on the distribution of the data. I'm saying I'm assuming that the devices have some data and associated with it a loss function. Okay. Yes. Uh, but it's always converged even if the data is not IAD. It's not IAD. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm going to talk about that later. I'm going to talk about a metric later that captures this concept of IAD, non IAD. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it, it actually converges as long as you choose, you choose as suitably the parameter. Yeah. Uh, yes. 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 If, if the devices at each cluster are heterogeneous and uh, some of them has more uh, updates and some of them has less, uh, does this affect the convergence? Uh, for example, if the, the mobile has five updates, but the car has 15 updates. Uh, mm -hmm. does this well, uh, we don't have that uh, flexibility, at least here in this paper, right? But that's an important question to, to understand. Like, uh, if you might have stragglers, for instance, that are slowing down your learning. Uh, we don't have that flexibility in this frame. In a way, the, each cluster is 
forcing a certain number of updates and you need to follow that. But yeah, you're right that in principle, you might have some devices that are slower than others and they do less updates. Yeah, you, you can do that. That's going to work. I mean, we, I don't think that our analysis accommodates for that in a way, but yeah, you can definitely do that, right? Yeah. yeah. What is the advantage of doing a device to device consensus say, inside the cluster instead of uh, making, for example, a train station? Okay. Well, the base station could actually coordinate that kind of device to device. You could do that. That's a uh, that would be a special case of this device to device. So the, the device to device communication creates a certain topology, right? As a special case, if you have a base station that where the communication is happening, you have a topology which is a start topology, right? Yeah. As a special case. But more, more generally, you might have device to device connectivity, okay? Let's okay. say some nodes might not be due to blockers, some nodes might not be able to communicate directly with. Uh, Imagine a drone that is flying at a certain altitude may not have a, a good connection with the base station, for instance, due to the side lobes and like the, uh, yeah. Okay. So in that case, you know, you need to have this kind of device to device connectivity. If it's possible, it's better to have a style one because in one, just one iteration. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you might, yeah. We, are, we can accommodate that as a special case. Okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Okay. There are so many questions. So you seem to ask a lot from test devices that would be able to perform training that they should do it, for instance. Usually at the edge, you don't have a lot of capabilities or uh -huh. to the right batteries and so on. Can you elaborate on the energy overhead? On the energy overhead? Yeah, energy or computation. Or... Okay, of doing this local computation, you mean? Yeah, of doing training at the edge in addition to it. Okay. Uh, well, what the edge devices are doing is basically competing gradients, right? Mm -hmm. And you can uh, you can trade off that cost by, for instance, you do, doing this mini bus training, right? So in principle, you can pick one single image and do training on that one single image, right? For example, so we can like balance this that trade off in a way. So our framework accommodates it. We can we can do that. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, let's uh, let's keep going. So, yeah. So now I'm gonna show you. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about this concept of uh, data heterogeneity. Okay, uh, which causes some problems in the trade-off between convergence and uh, and the network cost. Okay, so let's look at this scenario. This is a, a, a famous data set. It's called Fashion and Mist data set. It contains sixty thousand images of fashion items, okay? 10 different types of fashion items. So you might have a scenario like, let's say this cluster has only access to certain types of, uh, of images, let's say pullover, dress, and coat. And this other cluster has only access to sandals, shirt, and sneaker, okay? So this depends on how the data is distributed over the network, okay? So what it means is that this, cl this cluster here if, if you want to do the cluster optimization without doing any kind of global aggregation okay, and global coordination, the best this cluster can do is being able to tell apart these three items from each other. But if you provide an image of a standard, it will not be able to, to detect it. Okay? The same about this cluster. If it, if it only relies on this cluster optimization, this cluster will only be able to distinguish standards from shirt from sneaker, but if you provide a code, it will not be able to tell that apart, right? So that's the power of the global aggregation. The global aggregation makes it possible to basically learn this global loss function, which, which, which is equivalent to, equivalent to having a much richer data set that contains all these six items now. And so when the devices get this model back, this global model back, they're able to detect all these items instead of only the three that the cluster is able to learn to detect. Okay, so that's the advantage of this framework. But you know, you have this issue now that the cluster function G1 and G2, they are biased towards that local data set, which is the cluster, right? And so, so the image will look like this. Let's say 
the cluster number one is optimizing this function here. The cluster two is optimizing this green function here, but the global function looks like this, okay? So if you only rely on this cluster optimization, this cluster here will, will convert to this cluster optimum. This cluster here will convert to this optimum, and there is a mismatch between them, okay? What you would like to learn is this global optimum here, the black one, okay? Again, the global synchronization is taking care of that. But, you know, uh, and so this, this is measured by this concept of gradient diversity. So basically, I look at the cluster function, I look at the cluster gradient, I look at the global gradient at a certain W, I measure the, the distance between them, and this is measuring the upper bound of that, is upper bound in that distance, okay? So the video scenario where you have highly dissimilar uh, databases at each cluster, you, you might have an high values of these parameters, beta and, and zeta. We, we might have not having highly dissimilar functions, okay? And so when you have highly dissimilar function, what happens is that you need to do more frequent global aggregation to make sure that the models stay close to each other, okay? And also fewer rounds of class optimization. So again, there is this trade-off between how many cluster optimization you do and how much how many rounds of global aggregation we do. And that trade-off is determined by this gradient diversity bound, okay? On the opposite, you might have that these clusters are rich enough that they have a very rich data set. So the cluster functions, they actually look like each other very much. And so in that case, you're gonna have a, a small degree of gradient diversity. The, this gradient diversity is gonna be small, which means that each cluster can rely solely on its own cluster optimization without needing to do the global aggregation, okay? So when you have low similarity, you can do more rounds of cluster optimization and only very few rounds of global aggregation. And you are gonna save a lot in terms of network resources. So in terms of proving the convergence, you're gonna to have to basically use this bound to, to make sure that these errors here do not propagate too much, okay? Do not become too big. And that's gonna be determined that maybe step size number of global uh, cluster optimization phases and so on, okay? Yes. Yeah. Um, how scalable do you actually think the uh, machine learning is? So if you compare two classes, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's actually, it's actually quite scalable because of this hierarchical structure, in a way. Each cluster is taking care of itself, in a way. Mm -hmm. And then they send this global information to the cluster, to the server, the server, is collecting this information and making some kind of decision that is propagating back to the cluster. So it's actually quite scalable. Well, is there a communication overhead then that you have to consider? In that yeah, of course, there's going to be some communication overhead in terms of like coordination. That just just that we have. Scalability also okay, is affected by the communication overhead, correct? Right? Uh, we did not take that into account. We don't we don't think it was a particularly big overhead okay. compared to the communication overhead in terms of like sending like this model updates. That, that was a main bottleneck that we were concerned about. Yeah. Okay. So the other issue that I did not talk about before is that before the description was assuming a fully connected graph, which means that in one single round of consensus, each node is able to compute the average of the cluster. In practice, that might not be true. For instance, in this scenario, you might have a blockage and so the drone is not able to communicate with the phone directly. In this case, you have a disconnected graph. And so you need multiple rounds of consensus in order to propagate the information across the network and be able to compute the average. So in this case, what's going to happen is that you're going to have an error in the consensus case. So you compute the average, but now with an error term. And you're going to be careful about making sure that this error is not too big in terms of choosing the number of consensus rounds. And so now let's look at the convergence properties. Uh, I'm gonna, I wanna give you some intuition. So this is what we found before for the stochastic SDD algorithms. So we have this contraction term here. So the new update, old update, contraction term, and you have the STD noise term. So as long as you need, you make the noise term, the variance of the noise term proportional to step size square, everything converges fine, okay? So now when, when we look at, as a new algorithm that is developed, we end up with this kind of 
bound. Now it is more complicated. You still have this contraction factor. You should, should you still have this uh, SCD noise term, which is again proportional to eta squared, so it's fine. But now we have this additional term. So this one is a consensus term, the error due to consensus. And you want to make sure that this term epsilon are proportional to the step size eta, so that the square of them is proportional to eta squared. Again, I need eta squared in order to make sure that it converges. Okay. And in fact, we can prove that with a fixed number of and also a suitable number of consensual rounds, we can actually make this error of the order of eta. Okay. Or eta squared over. So everything is fine. You also have this other term, which is a model dispersion, due to the fact that each cluster is optimizing a cluster model. And so you might have a mismatch between the cluster model, the average across the cluster, and the global model, the average across the entire network. And this grows over time if you, if you don't take, if you're not careful with it. And so you can also make sure you have an eta here. You want to make all of these terms of order eta. And we can actually show that we can have. We can make that possible using a fixed number of uh, class optimization rounds and a suitable number, of course. Yeah. Uh, just to be sure that there aren't any error uh, future miscommunications. So you said you can make it be like eta squared by multiple consensus rounds or multiple communication attempts? Multiple, multiple, no, they're not communication attempts, they're consensual rounds. So I communicated with you, I communicated with. With her, okay. So I'm not communicating with her directly, right? I send you my model, you send me mine, and you do that over multiple rounds. So by doing this, the, the information diffuses over the network. So let's say in two iterations, I'm going to be able to receive her model, right? And then I can do that. But you know, this is going to introduce some errors in the, in the, in the uh, average computation, right? So yeah, and that's what I'm taking care of here. I'm taking care of these errors. If you choose enough enough rounds, this error can be made small. Okay. okay, so yeah, so I just want to give an intuition here. So basically, I have this contraction uh, contraction factor. I want to make sure that all these error terms are out of the order of step size squared in order to make it possible to converge. And we can actually show that if, uh, to be possible. And so at the end, we have that. If by choosing a step size decreasing exact one over time, we can show that the error between the, the loss evaluated as the current model at t and the loss evaluated as the global optimum vanishes as one over time. Okay, which is similar to what we have seen before in the centralized case in terms of order. Okay. So now I'm going to show you some numerical results. So I take the same fashion and mixed uh, data set. So I'm gonna, the way it works is that each device, so I'm gonna have 25 clusters, each cluster has five nodes. Uh, the, the device to device connectivity graph is based on the wireless signal quality. So if the signal to noise ratio is big enough based on the distance, then I'm gonna have a link, otherwise I don't have a link. And uh, the device to device connectivity, you need to be able to have this orthogonal link. So the orthogonality is maintained through an OSBMA system. Uh, I consider two types of uh, machine learning models. One is a support, regularized support vector machine, and the other is a fully connected neural network. Okay? Uh, the issue is that this SBM has exactly all the nice properties of convexity that we need in the analysis, whereas this one does not satisfy the convexity properties. So we want to make sure that it's actually working even in non convex environments. Uh, so what we do is that we randomly assign three categories of images to each device. So for instance, this one is going to get access to shirt, sneaker, and bag to a number of images from that category. And the drone here is going to get access to pullover, dress, and coat, number of images from that. Okay. So we create this, we distribute all the data to the devices randomly. And so you see that you are creating some kind of data heterogeneity here. Um, so here, this is some results. I'm looking at the accuracy of the uh, of the prediction over time, and this is loss function over time. Of course, the loss function is going down as I'm training. The accuracy is going up as I'm being, as I'm being able to more uh, accurately predict uh, the class. Okay. So this is a centralized framework. 
of course, it's going it's going to be the best, right? Because centralized, and I don't care about communication resources. I'm just centralizing all the computation and all the communication. So best accuracy, of course. Uh, this red one is the worst one, and this is a uh, a state of the art hybrid. So the way it works is that I'm doing I'm doing the global aggregation only periodically every twenty slots, let's say. And in fact, that's why you see this jump every 20 is when I'm doing the global aggregation. Okay. In between, this is local learning. And then I have the jump when I do the global aggregation. And so, uh, but the, the difference with our framework is that it does not take advantage of this device to device connectivity. So all the devices do the local training, and then the, all of them, they send the model to the server. Okay. So it's, it still uses quite a bit of communication resources because all the devices need to do this update. Okay. And in fact, it's doing the worst, and the reason it's doing the worst is that it's not taking advantage of this device to device connectivity okay, to learn a cluster model at the least. Instead, we are doing better. So, this is the Cyan one, is again, same period of global aggregation 20, but five rounds of this device to device communication. Whereas, you only do one round of device to device communication, the performance deteriorates a little bit due to the consensus errors. Due to the errors in the address computation. Okay. So, this is the case of a neural network instead. And of course, neural networks are quite a bit more involved, so you can learn better models. And in fact, the accuracy goes down quite a bit. But you see a similar trend that we can still do better, slightly better than the state of the art, but you know, we are very close to the centralized team now. Okay. So now this is an interesting picture that shows the performance in terms of uh, network resources. We look at energy and delay. So the way we do it is that we assign an energy and delay cost to the device to device communication, an energy and delay cost to the device to server communication, and vice versa. Okay. So typically, of course, delay, the, the, the delay and energy cost of device to device is much less than delay and energy cost of. Uh, edge to server, and this is better in terms of percent. So, 1% here, 5%, 10%, 15% is the ratio between the device to device energy and the edge to server energy. Similarly, within each here, we have these four bars. Each one corresponds to an increasing percentage of the device to device delay versus edge to server delay. Okay. So, what you notice here is that the centralized team. That was doing the best in terms of accuracy. Now it's doing the worst in terms of user metal resources, which makes sense because I'm all the time sending a new model and synchronizing with the edge. Okay, all the time. So it's in terms of delays, the most costly, in terms of energy, the most costly. Okay. The state of the art, which is the one without device device connectivity, but only with infrequent updates, of course, it's doing better than that because it's it's only doing periodical. Global aggregations instead of doing that all the time. Okay? So it's going to save in terms of delay and energy resources in the system. What we do here, we actually implemented this online control aggregate that I mentioned about earlier, where we adapt online the number of consensus rounds, we adapt online the period of cluster optimization. That is done online by trading off network cost, delay, and accuracy. You know, okay? And we can do a lot better. Okay. So you see that this framework where we are taking advantage of the device to device connectivity allows us to train much more efficiently in the network. Okay. By taking advantage of decentralized computing and decentralized communication. Okay. So do you have questions so far? Yes. For the yeah, the, the analysis, the analytical, the analysis is based on strongly converged boost, right? Okay. But the numerical results, we have done an extensive evaluation of with neural net through it are non complex. Okay, okay. And what prevents the analysis to be extended to the non Oh, it, it, it's possible. It's like a, when you look at the non complex case, you, don't, you no longer look at convergence to the optimal because there is no way you know that what the optimal is with the non complex function. All you care about is a stationary pop. Okay. So what you want to show is that the gradient goes down to zero. Let's say you could do that. The, the analysis might be more involved. We're not right, to be honest, but it's something we want to look at. Uh, but the, the convergence property changes. So we proved, for instance, before that the convergence goes down is one over k. You might not be able to prove that in the case of 
non-convex case. Okay, so the convergent property changes, you know, those factors change. So even for the uh, strongly convex case, you are not able to match the optimal rates in this scenario. So you don't you don't get the actual disagreement of the two convergence. Ah, but that's because we have STD. Sorry, we have STD as well. Okay. So we have stochastic gradients, and as we have seen before in the centralized case, even with strongly convex both function, STD goes down in one of the case. Yeah, so it makes sense. It's consistent with the centralized case. Okay. And that's due to the stochasticity of the gradient that we need to iterate over time. Okay, yes. What if, if you add like uh, momentum or. Uh, ah, okay. I mean, locally in each client, so you are uh, an optimizer with momentum, like every goal method and stuff, mm -hmm. or maybe Adam. Yeah. Locally on group. Does make any difference for the convergence? Well, it might uh, might be a little bit complicated to analyze, maybe. Uh, but you know, we have not tried that. But that, that's an interesting question, right? To, to, to look at different type of optimizers. Yeah. yeah. But is there any proof for in general for uh, federated learning? Mm. As far as I've seen, no. In, in the case of decentralized learning, yeah, there might be actually uh, this kind of proofs. But I've not seen that in the specific context of federated learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Is this the energy only for communication or for the cross section? Uh, yeah. Good question. It's, it's only communication. We're assuming that communication is the bottleneck in a way. Um, but uh, for example, um, uh, world networks, if you take advantage yeah. of batch uh, training, so you can uh, reduce the energy. But here, um, uh, for example, for the learning for the, your uh, networks, the batch mm -hmm. will be. Yeah, yes, that's the trade off, right? Yeah. yeah, that's true. So, there are two cases where we want to use a city. One is we use this mini batch size to reduce the computation, but of course, you're going to slow down the train, right? So, it's right. The other case is when this, the data comes, for instance, in real time, right? I'm getting a new data, a new image. I want to train, I want to add these data points to the image, then I can throw it away and I keep, I get this data that is coming in real time, right? That's another case where we use. Before you talk about the mean, right? as an example of SD, but it's more, uh, we look at two architectures. One is a centralized one, which we have seen is very inefficient in terms of communication of resources, network resources, but it's the most accurate one, right? Because everything is done, computations are centrally, the server collects all the data, right? Uh, we have looked at this semi decentralized learning architecture, so where instead we are decentralizing the computation and also decentralizing the communication. And so we can take advantage of that to, have, to, to come out with a much more, much more lightweight learning architecture, which is more efficient over networks. Okay. Uh, however, the problem is that it's still, you know, it's still more, uh, um, the delay might be a problem because you are still interacting with a server which might be remote. And so it's not amenable to real time application. Okay. There might be some application, let's say it's work of drones, where you need to be able to learn in real time. Okay. So in that case, you prefer to be serverless. You don't want a server. You want to be able to operate in a decentralized, completely decentralized fashion without the help of a remote server. Uh, and so this is more suitable for real-time application. It lacks a single point of failure. The server, if the server pays, you know, everything breaks down. Whereas here, it's a decentralized system. Each agent has the same weight. So even if one breaks down, the other can still operate. However, it tends to be much more difficult to manage because you don't have this kind of hierarchical learning architecture. Now everything is decentralized. So it's, it's more complicated to study. Okay, So I'm going to give you some uh, intuition about this uh, case and give you some uh, uh, talk about some of the research that we have done. So let's look at the system. Now we have uh, this decentralized system where I have this uh, graph here that describes the connectivity of the network. So for instance, device number one can only talk with four and two, but cannot talk directly with three and five. Okay. So each device has its own local view of the system, which is described as this loss function G1 to G5, which might be different from each other. 
And again, I have a global loss function, which is a sum of the local loss function for the domain term. So what I want to try to do is learn this global W, which minimizes this global loss function. Okay? But now I don't have a server that is helping me. Everything that is centralized, I can only do the communication over this graph. Okay. So I'm going to talk about a specific algorithm. This is called a distributed gradient descent, which is appeared in this paper several years ago. But it's a very it's a popular algorithm. It's just one example, one example of several other algorithms that, that have been proposed since then. Um, but it's, it's an interesting example. So the way it works is the following: time k, every every agent has a certain copy of the state. Okay. Which might be distinct from each other. So node one has W1, node two has W2, and so on, at time k. Okay. So now I'm going to do something similar to what I've been uh, done before. I'm going to communicate with the neighbor. I'm going to com communicate my state to the neighbor. And at the same time, I'm going to receive copies of the state of my neighbors as well. So now this node one is going to receive uh, copies of the state of the neighbors to four. What it's going to do is consensus. I'm going to do an average, a weighted average of my own state and the state of the neighbors, followed by this gradient step based on the local function. Okay, so it's similar to what we have seen before, where each node was doing a local gradient step and then the global aggregation, but now it's done all in concurrently, okay, and all in a decentralized fashion without the help of a server. Yeah, so if you look at node generic node view. The new state is equal to an, an weighted average of the neighbor's state minus a fat times gradient of the local loss function, computing, computed as a local state. Okay, so this, this is the consensus phase. It has a property that's a weighted average. So all the weights sum to one, and then I'm going to assume also that they are symmetric. So the weight from i to j is equal to the weight from j to one. So this symmetry is actually quite helpful in terms of convergence properties. Okay. So now what I can do, I can take all the local variables, stack them over the network. So I'm going to stack W1, W2, all the way to all the nodes over a big vector. And I'm going to look at this as a, as an, a big update, right? So the new state is equal to the old state multiplied by these weights, right? Which emulates the weight in operation. So this is called, this is a matrix that I'm going to call lambda. It's a, you know, you might call it a diffusion matrix. It's a matrix that is all the rows and columns sum to one because it's a weighted average. And it's a symmetric matrix. Okay. So, so the new state is equal to the old state times this diffusion matrix, lambda times w, minus eta times the gradient step. Okay. So what I'm going to do is define this new loss function, which is a sum of the loss function, but with respect to the global loss function, is a Function evaluated at the local state. Okay, so GU evaluated at WU. Okay, as opposed to GU evaluated at at W, which is the same across the network. Okay, so the gradient of this function across this big vector is exactly equal to this. Okay, so now you can see that here the new state is equal to lambda previous state minus theta this gradient of this function. Okay, now. Let's see how this algorithm works. So now I can organize the terms as follows. So as new state equal to lambda new state minus theta gradient, I can rewrite this in this way. New state is equal to all state minus eta times all of this. So now if you look carefully, all of this term here can be interpreted as a gradient of, of a different function, this one. So this one is a gradient of this function. So this term here is a gradient of this, this term here is the gradient of this quadratic function. So you can interpret this function as being a, penali a penalized function. So I have my, in a way, my global loss function here, but evaluate it as a local state of the node of the agents, plus as this penalty term. I'm going to show what this penalty term is doing. However, so basically, what you can interpret this distributed gradient descent as a gradient descent algorithm on a penalized loss function. Which is different from the overall goal, which is actually to solve this problem. Okay, you see the difference here. I don't have any penalty, 
And also, all the Ws are the same across the network, whereas here, each node has its own W. So the two functions are different. So it's not clear that DGT is actually solving these problems, right? So I'm going to use some equation of that's actually what's happening here, at least approximately. So again, I can interpret the DGT as an language solving this new penalized problem. Okay. So now let's look at this penalty term here. Okay. W is a stacking of all the local Ws across the network. Okay. So now I'm going to define the network average. I take the W, I look at the average W of the net, W of the network. And that's going to be the bar W at the average of the net. Okay. okay. And again, I create this big vector by stacking over the entire network. I'm going to define this vector E as a deviation from the average. Okay. For example, E1 is a deviation of the node one local state with respect to the network average. Okay. E1, E2, all the way to all the nodes. Okay. Now, what happens if I take the diffusion matrix and multiply it by this network average? Vector. Well, since remember this is doing an averaging operation, right? So if we do an average of something that is already been averaged, averaged, I still obtain bar W, right? So you have this identity that the fusion matrix times the average of the state is equal to the average of the state. Okay? In other words, bar W is an eigenvector of this diffusion matrix associated with eigenvalue one. Okay. So now let's look at the penalty term, which is this one. Okay. W transpose times identity minus lambda times W. So now due to this equality here, I can move inside, I can basically subtract this average from W without any modification. But now what is this term here? W minus bar W is a deviation from average, right? So now basically what I'm showing here is that the penalty term here is basically only a function of the deviations from the averages. What the penalty is doing is penalizing deviations from the average across the network. It's basically forcing the consensus across the network. Okay, that's what it's doing. So now let's look at the scenario where eta is very small. When eta is very small, one over eta is very big. This penalty is very big. This penalty is highly penalizing any deviation from the average. So you can think that this deviation from the average, let's say, is approximately zero. But every, every node, which means that every node is going to have approximately the same copy of the state, the same bar W. Okay? So now remember that DGD is actually optimizing this function. But now when the step size is very small, the error becomes zero, which means that this penalty term becomes basically approximately zero. All the W are equal to the same average W. And so you see that optimizing this function becomes equivalent to optimizing what was our initial goal. Okay. So, in other words, it's the limit when the step size goes to zero, DGD solves the global optimization problem. Okay. But more in general, you can actually show that the distance between the solution of this penalized problem and the original problem is bounded away by a factor proportional to the step size. So, if you make the step size small enough, you can make that arbitrarily accurate. Okay. Yeah, so that's for sure. So now, since we know that basically DGD is a greater descent aggregate on a penalized function, we can apply all the commercial properties of the greater descent aggregate. So we're going to have this kind of, again, for the strongly convex function, we're going to have this kind of linear convergence ray up to uh, an error, which is proportional to the step size. Okay, so we can apply all those convergence properties, and so the algorithm works this way. So basically, approximately, we are solving the original problem, but I'm in a fully decentralized fashion, okay, without any coordination from the server. So now I'm going to show you this actually. This algorithm is uh, can be embedded in a more general framework that describes several other algorithms that have been proposed since DGD. Okay. DGD in a way is a more basic algorithm, but there are several other algorithms that have been proposed in the decentralized learning literature that tend to be actually quite a bit more efficient and more and faster in terms of conversion rate. So the way the general framework works is as follows: at time k, I have a local state. Then, based on local state, I compute a communication signal. 
This is a similar kind of one I used to communicate with the neighbors. In the case of DGT, the communication signal is equal to the state itself. Okay? But more in general, you might have something else. At this point, you have the communication phase. So every, every, every node will say, for instance, node number one is going to have its own communication signal and copies of the communication signals of the neighbors two and four. So now, based on my own local state and the communication signal of all the neighbors, I'm going to use this state update function where I compute a new state from the communication signals and from my own local state. Okay. And so again, DGD is a special case of that framework with a suitable choice of the state of the function and of the communication function. Okay. But there are several other algorithms that have been proposed again. DGD is one of them, but there are next extra DG. There are several other algorithms. I'm not going to go into the details, but just let you know that there are several of them that have been proposed. So one of the problems of all these algorithms is that uh, communication has to be the bottleneck of this system. Communication tends to be very expensive. For instance, if you consider a deep neural network, the weights across the network, you, you might have millions of weights. If you think of representing each one of these weights using machine precision, which is for bits, it's quite a lot of. Uh, the, status, the status quo in terms of uh, this quantization algorithm is the following. I take a very specific algorithm, let's say DGT or extra or next. I take one algorithm. For that specific algorithm, I'm going to define a very ad hoc scheme, quantization scheme that work, works only for that algorithm. Okay. And then I can analyze these conversion properties, making sure that the quantization errors are not too severe and look at the conversions, okay? So that's basically the state of that applying to different algorithms, including our own uh, work. Uh, here you have a list, you can find the paper, all the details. Uh, but more or less the state of that. What we're interested in is that is treating this general framework as a general framework where of which every algorithm is a special case, okay? What we want to come out with is a unified block, black box quantization framework where you give me the algorithm, I give you the quantization scheme, it's a black box quantization scheme, and it's, I can guarantee you that it's going to work as long as you choose a step size and all the parameters suitable. Okay. So, particularly with target algorithms with linear convergence rate, DGD is one example, linear convergence. Again, the new, the new distance is equal to lambda times the previous distance, where lambda is a contraction factor. Okay. Again, all these algorithms are a special case of this framework. Typically, they all revolve around solving a distributed optimization problem, like this one. Okay. So now I'm going to give you an intuition of the key, uh, key concept to using our quantizers. So the first one is the idea of differential encoding and decoding, which I has actually been proposed before. But the idea is that instead of quantizing the communication signal directly without modification, it's more efficient to quantize innovations in the signal, that is changes over time in the signal. So if you think of an optimization algorithm, for instance, the signals over time will tend to become more stable. So the changes in the signal will tend to become less severe. And so it's much more efficient instead of quantizing the signal directly to quantize only changes in the signal, okay? Quantize the innovation. And that's the idea of differential encoded decoding. It's a little bit more tricky than that. You're going to have to keep track of a reconstruction of the communication signal over time. And then basically quantize the difference between the communication signal and quantized and the reconstruction. And then you update the reconstruction in real time to make sure that uh, all the network is synchronized in a way, okay? But th that's the idea. You, want to, you only want to quantize innovations rather than to quantize the signals directly, okay? To use bits more efficiently. The second thing, key concept is that in order to prove the convergence properties, we need to make sure that the quantization errors do not propagate in a bad way, right? So we need to be able to bound the amount of quantization error. So this is the error between the quantized signal and the signal itself, okay? We define this bias compression rule, which is an upper bound basically on the quantization error. It's made of two terms. The first one is 
um, basically defines like a uniform quantization with shrinking rate. Okay? So if you if you discard this one, you only have this one, you see that what I'm saying is that the quantization arrow is upper bounded by a constant, which is basically defining a uniform quantizer. Quantizer with points that are quantization level that are equally spaced apart. Okay. The key concept here is that we have a shrinking range. So over time we are shrinking the range of the quantizer to a we are being more precise with the quantizer. Why so? We are targeting algorithms with linear convergence, so where all the signals are linearly converging. So at the same time, for the same reason, we want to also the quantizer to become exponentially more precise over time. Okay. The second term actually much of the literature uses this terminization without this bias term here. And this defines some kind of compression operator. And you can look at it as being a, uh, basically a quantizer with points that are more dense towards the zero and more sparse as you move away. Okay, so now you can take advantage of these two parameters, Z and W, by to, to basically try to optimize the communication budget. Okay, it gives you some degrees of freedom that you can use to optimize the communication budget. So that's the second key concept. In the proof that we have, we're going to use this bound basically to make sure that the quantization errors do not propagate too much in the network. Okay, to bound those errors. The third key concept, yes. A quick question: uh, Is X the, the signal you mentioned before? Is the are they the weights of the neural network or the gradients, or maybe? Well, it depends on the algorithm. Right? It's a general framework, right? Okay. In the case of DGD, it's the weights. Okay. okay, but you can also you can also yeah. use the gradient. You yeah, there are some. For instance, next, the algorithm called next uses actually gradients to compute an estimate of the global gradient, okay. and tends to be much faster. You know. Okay, and you can also quantize. Degree. Yes, you can do that. So this is a general framework. You give me the algorithm, I use a black box quantization. You okay. apply it, and I can guarantee that it's going to work if you choose parameters in a suitable way. Okay. Yeah. The third key concept is that of adaptive encoding. So think again of optimization. The signals tend to stabilize over time, so this tend to become smaller and smaller over time. So we want to be able to use less bits for the zero signal for signals that are uh, small and more bits for signals that are far away from zero. And so that's why you use this adaptive encoding where you adapt the number of bits to the signal itself. So now we, based on the previous quantization rule, we came out with the quantization levels. Okay. And you can find that in closed form. Uh, now we want to use no, no bits at all for the signal zero. So let's assume an example of a ternary system. In a ternary system, we have three symbols. Since it's adaptive encoding, I need to have a way to signal the end of the message. So I'm going to use this T symbol to denote the termination. So in a terminal system, so you still have two more symbols, A and B, which I use for data. Okay. So the idea is that for the, for the level zero here, so this is quantization levels, which I am enumerating from negative seven to seven. The level zero, I use no symbol at all. Okay. So no, no communication cost. This negative one, you want to use only one symbol, A and B, and so on. These symbols here use two symbols. These levels here use two symbols, and so on. This one use three symbols. As I move away, I use more symbols, which is more communication costs, more bits. Okay? That's the idea of adaptive encoding. So, for instance, if you want to transmit the sequence of indices, negative six, zero, and three, I start with negative six, which is A and B. So, I have A and B here, then I terminate. To indicate the termination of the sequence T. Then I want to be zero, which is no symbol at all. So I have no symbol at all, and again termination T. Then I want to be three, which is BB, so I have BB and termination. So now we have this unique encoding structure, which allows the decoder basically to decode in a unique way, okay, without errors and without uncertainty in a way. Okay. But the advantage is that here I'm adapting the length of the message based on the message itself to make, to make more efficient use of the bits. So we can actually prove with, with all these ingredients put together that given a linearly convergent unquantized algorithm, so again, an algorithm that has this kind of linear convergence guarantees, unquantized, you give it, you give it to me, I give you this black box quantization scheme, and as long as the 
the quantization errors are small. I, I make them small enough, which means I use certain uh, choices of the quantizer. I can guarantee also linear commented rate, but with a rate sigma, which is slightly slower than the unquantized rate lambda. And that makes sense. That's the price that I have to pay to quantize information. I'm quantizing, I'm introducing quantization errors, which is going to slow down a little bit. But still, I still have linear convergence rate, which is good. You know, linear convergence rate tends to be fast. Okay? And here we can also quantify the number of bits that we need to achieve this rate. The number of bits per agent, per iteration, and per dimension of the problem. And what you can see is basically, if we want to get very close to the unquantized algorithm, if we want to make sigma close to lambda, all of these goes to infinity, which means that we need infinite bits basically to exactly replicate the unquantized algorithm, which makes sense. If we are willing to slow down the algorithm a little bit, we can also use much less bits. Okay? So we have this kind of trade off so that you can optimize. Okay, so now I'm gonna to, to, to finish in another couple of minutes. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some numerical results. So we consider the network like that where we have 20 agents which are randomly connected. The connections are completely random in the sense that each edge is activated probably probably to 60% randomly. Uh, we consider these web different metrics in the paper, but in, for this uh, presentation, I only choose this regular line logistic regression on the n niche data set, which is a data set of numeric digits from zero to nine that needs to be distinguished, okay? So in this case, we have basically each uh, data point in the data set is a 20 weight by 28 black and white image. So which means that the set of weights is a 784 dimensional vector. So if you think of using an unquantized algorithm, even sending a weight here with 64 bits precision, uh, machine precision, takes 50 kilobits per iteration per agent. Okay? So you can, you can see how expensive this can be in terms of communication when you need to do that several times across the entire network. And so there's an interfere in trying to reduce the communication budget. Okay? So again, the goal, the goal is to solve the global, uh, the global loss function. Okay. So now let's start with the unquantized algorithm. Here I choose these uh, three algorithms. One is a primal dual, next, and this. I'm not going to go into the details of this algorithm. They're similar in a way to DGD, but they have some more complicated layers in a way, uh, some more complicated updates. Uh, but you see that here I measure the, the performance test in terms of distance between the clean distance square between the state at time k, the natural state at time k, and the global optimum. Okay? As you can see, as the iteration progresses, all these algorithms are, are converging towards the optimum. Okay? This seems to be better than the other algorithms here, but it's not a specific property of the algorithm. You might have some other scenarios where next is working better, or it depends on the specific scenario. Here, this seems to be the best one. Okay? So again, if you look in terms of number of bits, this is bits per iteration, per agent, per dimension. So again, you have 800 dimensions. You will have to multiply by 800 to get the actual number of bits per agent, per iteration. So primal dual is using 64 bits. Next is using 128 because in addition to the weight, is also sending the gradients, okay? So it's double weight, a double number of bits. And needs is using 64 bits, okay? Now let's look at the state of the art. Again, state of the art is doing is what they're doing is defining ad hoc schemes that work only for specific algorithms. Okay. So for instance, this lead here is a quantized version of needs. So you see that it's losing something in terms of convergence, but it's only using three bits instead of 64 bits. So quite a bit better. And similar, you know, if you look at next, for instance, 128 bits, but the quantized version of next, which is this one, is only using 36 bits. Okay. Now let's look at our our black box key, so the circles. You see. So what you can see is that well, it's kind of surprising. We can actually very closely approach the convergence of the quantized algorithm. So this is basically overlapping. Okay, you don't notice any difference, right? But if we closely approach the performance of the quantized algorithm, 
while using only a fraction of bits. For instance, primal dual, 64 bits and contact bits. A and Q dual, which is adaptive non uniform, non -uniform quantization, our black spot scheme, 2.7 bits. So, dramatic reduction in the number of bits. Whereas the state of the art is using even more bits than that, despite converging words. Uh, if you look at next, using 128 bits, we are using only six bits. The ad hoc state of the art is using 36 bits and doing words. Uh, needs 64 bits, we're only using three. Okay, so the general message we were able to beat even ad hoc schemes, which is kind of surprising, we would expect an ad hoc scheme to work better. The key reason is due to the fact that many of these ad hoc schemes, they, they, they use a worst case scenario in terms of the number of bits. They don't use this idea of adaptive encoding. They use a fixed number of bits, irrespective of the message. And this number of bits is based on the worst case possible signal in each of these, okay? In order to be robust. So, whereas we are using this adaptive encoding where we adapt the length of the message to the message itself, the length of the number of bits to the message itself, which allows us to be a lot more efficient in terms of communication resources. And that's why we are, we are able to save quite a bit of bits, okay? So we are able basically to match the performance of the quantized algorithm with a fraction of bits. Yeah, so I'm gonna conclude here. We have to look at the machine learning over networks with a, an optimization lens. Uh, we look, we started from a centralized learning architecture where the server collects the information, all the data from the edge. And this is quite inefficient because in terms of communication resource, network resources, in terms of delay, and also in terms of privacy concerns. We move then to a federated learning architecture where I decentralize the computation, but they still centralize the communication with the server. Still, it's quite heavy in terms of natural resources because you have this back and forth of messaging between the server and the edge. From there, we move to a semi decentralized learning architecture where I'm decentralizing not only the communication, but also the computation. So I allow this edge to do, to optimize locally within clusters in order to have a more efficient learning as the edge. And we have seen that this saves quite a bit of network resources, but it's still not amenable to real-time application. When we go to real-time application, uh, we need to move to a fully decentralized architecture where the convergence has to be quite a bit more complicated. You have to be a lot more careful. Uh, does not acquire a server. It's suitable to real-time application. And what we have done in my group is look at how to quantize efficiently uh, a large class of these algorithms to enable much more efficient, communication efficient uh, learning. So, so you find details about these two works. The semi-decentralized one is on this JSAC paper that was published in, back in December. And the fully decentralized quantization algorithm is based on a recent paper that has to appear in the IT, IT transaction on information theory. So if you're interested, you go to my Google Scholar, you will find the links and uh, yeah. So your question, I can take a couple of questions, please, guys, or? Only one quick question. Oh, one quick question. <laughs> and then we will move the other question offline. Sorry about that, but we will have the next uh, talk in nine minutes. So it is better to do like that. Uh, ah, you see, you have, you have more questions. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, so did you uh, try to adapt the learning rate to the sparsity of the graph. The learning rate? Yeah. Oh, uh, we're not looked into that. I mean, we're... What, what I mean is that when you had your, your this, what you call it, penalization, uh, so the quadratic form with the lambda, it seems to me that if the lambda changes, I mean, the sparsity of the graph changes, the smaller step size could be. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, basically, you're talking about the basically the, the spectral radius, right, of these two methods, which is very much a function of the network topology. Yeah, you're right. Uh, in a way, you can you can look at the convergence properties more closely by relating that to the, this network topology, to the spectral radius. You can do that. I've done, done that in that in this presentation, but basically in our work, we have this black box model. Everything is capturing the rate lambda of the quantized algorithm. So, Everything is inside there. We don't care specifically where that comes from, you know, but we only know there is some lambda that capture all this network connectivity, the smoothness, strong convexity properties, all of that is capturing that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, 